Hello, everyone. This is Christina Jang from ITDP, and thank you for joining our webinar today. Before we begin, there are just a few things to note. Yes, the webinar will be recorded, and both the recording and PowerPoint will be available online on our website, and I will email it to you. To interact with our host today, please submit questions through the Q&A function, which is at the bottom or the top of your Zoom screen, and refrain from using the chat box. I also encourage you to enter questions throughout today's presentations as it will not interrupt our speakers. Again, thank you for joining us for our webinar today titled The Transformative Power of Tactical Urbanism in the Global South. Cities around the world are realizing the potential of using low cost materials like paint and planters, often re referred to as tactical urbanism projects, to reclaim street space and improve safety and comfort for pedestrians and cyclists. In today's webinar, panelists will briefly share how Global South cities are using these mechanisms to reclaim streets for people. First, we will start off with Daniele Hoppe, and she will discuss progress made in Brazilian cities through these projects, followed by Nor L. D. to uh, demonstrate Cairo's intersection treatment for cycle tracks. Um, we will also have Anissa Lazwandini to share temporary projects to improve Jakarta's MRT. And then finally, we will also hear from Ashwadi Dilip to highlight the power of tactical urbanism in transforming the grounds in Pune, Ranchi, and Chennai. Lastly, we will have a moderated discussion by Mackenzie Allen to uh, discuss the common challenges, success, and best practices that we've seen scaling up across these projects. Now I'll hand off the presentation to you, Daniele, and you can share your screen. Thank you, Christina. I'm gonna be... Is it all fine? Yes, it looks good on my end. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everyone, or good, good afternoon, or good, good evening. So I'm going to be talking to you about the, the process and the, the lessons we learned using tactical urbanism in Brazil. And I guess starting with the problem, um, about 37,000 people die on Brazilian roads or streets every year. So it's like a small, a small town disappearing every year. And in general, in our cities, pedestrians account for about 41% of the daily, uh, daily trips, while cars, they account for about 25% of these trips. And in spite of that, we tend to let cars occupy at least 70% of the space available on our streets. So we started wor working with tactical urbanism to tackle like these issues, especially. And, but if, if the, even if there is a, uh, already a certain love, level of awareness that we do need a more sustainable transportation system, especially when it comes to the need of public, uh, the, the discussion is like normally it's, it's very like, uh, it's very actual in Brazil, but especially when it comes to the need of public transit. But when this change touch the ground and start to take out the space of cars, we still face a lot of resistance. And I guess this is the same situation in different places. And we've, we've seen that the tactical urbanism initiatives, they can help ignite local transformation while we pursue a longer term change. So they, they make street transformation more tangible. They work as capacity building tool as we're gonna see the, during the uh, through the examples. The, as they are low cost uh, and they are replicable, so it's easy to, to, to get the first, uh, a first step done. They allow for testing and to, uh, adjustment before we, we really go into capital construction. And they work for as catalyzer for long-term uh, um, change. So going through our experiences in Brazil over the past few years, it all started back in 2014 through capacity building. And we, we had as an international consultant here in Brazil helping us, uh, Michael King. And we were doing capacity building workshops in, uh, for public government in Florianópolis and Rio de Janeiro. And at that time, we just went out with the, the participants to show them how easy it was to change a street character just using cones and showing that like 
that removing car space and changing uh, curb radius was not a, a big deal. We could you could do that very fast and with effective results. You could see these result, results happening. And that was the the start. And two years later, in 2016, we got involved in the. Um, in a big project in Sao Paulo in partnership with other international organizations. And this project was to redesign a whole uh, low speed zone in Sao Paulo. So we've chosen, there were like a, uh, several traffic calming interventions that were, that were planned. We chose one to do a tactical urbanism initiative. This is the, this is the place and this is how we did. And the idea here was to convince both government and the community that the project was important and that we could change significantly the character the, of, of the area. We could save lives through street redesign. So we managed to convince the city to do it. It was the first of uh, huge pop-up in Sao Paulo at that time, I guess. So at this size, we hadn't, we hadn't seen any other intervention at this size yet. And we got like, we really got, uh, as it was big at, for, for that time, I would say, I'd say it, it was big. We got to a lot of visibility and it resulted in the invitation for us to do a second one the, the following year in the architectural uh, Biennale of the, the local architectural Biennale. And this time we decided to, to improve the process and to get CD, uh, CD staff involved from the beginning. We had like community, community engagement meetings. We had like a, a local, uh, we communicated better the, the intervention for, for the community. And that was the, the result. We worked on two intersections. The, the intersections were chosen in partnership with the CD. They helped in the design as well. This is the second intersection. We activated the space for a day. And the city implemented that back in one year later, one year after the, the pop-up. Okay, one of the intersections was implemented. So this is the, the green one is the permanent implementation. This is it. And the, this permanent implementation was influenced for by the data we collected as well during in, in partnership with the city as well. And we had a report describing the whole process and, and the results. We went, we went back after the one year after the, the permanent intervention as well to collect new data. And we had a report that helped to replicate that, that initiative in Sao Paulo. Okay, the, at least then in 2018, one year after Santana intervention, the CD decided to do their own first uh, pop-up intervention. So this is in Giuseppe Bonifacio. It was a three-day pop-up, and they also implemented it partially. This is the the permanent implementation. And the following year, in well, at least in, in November 2018, we started to replicate that um, that model that we had been testing in São Paulo to other Brazilian cities. So the first one was Rio, and also also a, a pop-up for three days pop up. And there was a seven month process initiated with a capacity building workshop as well. We, we, we invited uh, public servants to, to participate in this, in this capacity building. We decided what to do. And then over seven months, we, we had regular meetings. We had like about 100 people involved in, in, the, two, uh, in, the, in the whole process. We had capacity building for bus drivers. And we had at the end in the implementation process during this uh, three day process, we had like about 50 public servants that were really directed involved. And here you can see the change we made. We, we, actually, we managed to change bus, bus stops. We had like adjustments to the project on sites. We had like the CD staff working together with us to implement that. And in 2019, also the result of a capacity building we had done in the city in Sorocaba, it's close to Sao Paulo. The city itself asked us to help them to do a sidewalk extension in their downtown area. So we did that, it lasted for a month. 
In 2019 as well, we had a partnership with the city of Belo Horizonte and also a three-day pop-up. And this is, these are the pictures. We also activated the space for a few days. And finally, the, the last intervention we got involved with uh, the Bloomberg Initiative in NACTO in, in Sao Paulo was a Peña, which was the longest process we had. It, it's, it was like a two month inter intervention. It was about two blocks. And we had two, two highlights or two intersections were, and uh, a small alley that were also redesigned. And this was the first time that in Sao Paulo we managed to really engage the community in the design. So we had uh, we had two two workshops where people could we, where we identified demands and then we had them select the different designs and help us to re refine them. Oops, sorry. And this is currently under implementation. Okay. I haven't mentioned before, but uh, in Belo Horizonte, uh, the intervention is also currently under implementation. Santana was implemented, Jose Bonifacio as well. São Miguel Paulista is now partially being implemented. Some sidewalk extensions are, are on the way, but not the full, the full project. And Sorocaba Soro and Rio were also not implemented. Well, and then to conclude, I, I just wanted to say that even if not all of the inter interventions we, we managed to implement were became permanent, I do think that they were very efficient tools to raise awareness about street design and to help disseminate these concepts to technical staff, to decision makers, to communities. Because what we could, we could see is that even if they didn't get implemented, they did spur, like they, they had spin offs in, either in process in the cities. They, here in Rio, we had like a committee that was created inside one of the city departments because of that, like to discuss uh, street design change. We had in Belo Horizonte, it, which is on it's under implementation, but we also had like seven or about seven demands from from the population to to implement similar initiatives in other areas. We also had two other pop up interventions. The help that happened a few months later so in Belo Horizonte, that was also the, the first time they had a, such a big pop-up intervention. So in a sense, if we haven't had the implementation for all of that, uh, for, for all of them, I do believe we have, like, they, they, this, these initiatives, they can incite change, you know. And when they, they get implemented, there is, I guess, still the challenge of the final design, we still have to, to work on that. As you, we, we've been seeing on the on, on the constructions, there are still problems. You really need to be close and help with the this to refine the street design. That is being implemented. The materials, the the furniture, sometimes the cities, they don't have how to buy the 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 right furniture. So other organizations are supplying that, and also. I guess the, the next challenge once you implement is how to maintain that. So I would say we do need to create a, a local institutional arrangement. We really engage community from the beginning so they help to maintain these, these interventions. We do need to, to improve that, that, that kind of partnership in Brazilian cities. And well, I guess this is it. So thank you. We can discuss better or during the the panel discussion. Great, thank you so much, Daniele. We can go ahead and uh, now transition to Anissa. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Anissa from ITDP Indonesia. So today I'm going to talk about how we've been improving access to MRT Jakarta stations using a quick low budget interventions, probably known as tactical urbanism. 
And to give you a little background, um, ITDP Indonesia has been developing a participatory planning and design approach, specifically in dense residential areas known as kampung or urban village. So in 2018, we collaborated with local residents of Sundarjaya to improve accessibility within the area with a focus on vulnerable groups of residents, including children, elderly, women, and people with disabilities. So most of the design outputs are using tactical urbanism kind of approach with a quick low budget improvement and all is done through collaboration with local residents only, not involving the government yet. And um, in Jakarta, most of residential areas actually have shared streets with not much signs and road marks, hence they mostly still prioritize motorized vehicles. And so generally we use the concept of tactical urbanism approach to reimagine how a shared street can be safer through these projects. And so this method was then also used in our other project, aiming to improve pedestrian accessibility to MRT stations, collaborating with the MRT Jakarta themselves. And we have implemented low cost interventions in two elevated stations, both consisting of shared streets and very narrow alleyways. And therefore we tried to change the behavior of motorized vehicle users to increase the street safety. And so this project was actually initiated after our team did an accessibility audit on 500 meter radius within the new MRT stations. And none of them are adequate enough to our TOD standard of 80% decent walkways yet, especially in areas within elevated stations. So shown on the screen is a walkways audit on our pilot station area, Cipateraya, where collectors and residential roads are still inadequate. And so as can be seen on the photo, the walkways on the road towards the station doesn't even exist. Most of the walkways conditions are exactly like this or even more narrow and act as a shared street. And uh, one of the reason is that these areas are mostly residential and also classified as collector and local roads often are not a priority area of improvement. And so it requires a lot of interstakeholders collaborations, which often got stuck in the process the bureaucracy. So this is where a tactical urbanism approach can help with its quick, low cost, non-permanent characteristics as a trigger to show what changes are actually needed in these local roads. And uh, this is the pilot location of our MRT accessibility improvement project. So um, there's an elementary school located on the road just 70 meters from the stations, uh, as you can see on the picture on your right, uh, of which interconnected to a network of local streets and small alleyways, which picture is on your left. And so most of the students here are walking or cycling to school as they live nearby. And this is a shared street with no segregated walkways. And as can be seen on the key plan, the school area is located in a hook and the alleyway has a crisp L shape. So making it kind of dangerous for children who usually run and play while walking as there are a lot of motorcycles and cars. And so from our observations, we found that in 15 minutes, at least 65 people are walking in the street and 55 out of 65 are school children. So the alleyway is the most preferred shortcut as well for the local residents, yet uh, there are a lot of conflict with motorized vehicles, um, making it not very safe for children. So uh, basically in order to have a better understanding on these issues, we engaged with local communities and the key group was actually the women community because they stay longer in the area compared to other groups of residents and also have regular communal activities which involve vulnerable groups and yes, yeah, so a further understanding on accessibility issues mostly came from the discussions with this group. And so we went through a co-design process with residents and local leaders using discussions over design illustrations and on-site um, surveys. And um, well, once the design has been agreed, we then coordinate with local government to make the project acknowledged amongst local stakeholders. Because through this coordination, we can also get a chance to collaborate with the technical sub agencies to make a minor quick improvement to prepare the street to be in its best condition for us to make an intervention. And so um, the key of high participation is from the locals is also using a familiar form of activities uh, we call here Kerja Bakti, which occurs usually monthly, but usually it is in a form of collective cleanup within a neighborhood. So this special time was dedicated for painting the street together with all layers of communities, men, women, youth, children. 
and some technical subagencies field workers will also participating to help the improvement on the main road as yeah, it has somewhat uh, rigid kind of regulations and um, optimizing the implementation to be finished in just a half day, which is the usual durations of Kerja Bakti. We created a highly detailed plan for the day and divided the area into four segments with 150 participants. Um, and the impact mostly can be seen qualitatively in terms of user perceptions on walking safety. And while not all vehicles have changed their behavior due to the painted interventions, but around 82% of the respondents find the painted walkways help them feel safer, at least for them to let their children walk to school, as the main group of pedestrians who use these interventions is school children. And we are not actually expecting different level walkways or segregated walkways to be permanently implemented here, but it's to rethink on how a shared street can be safer, especially for vulnerable groups of users. And um, highlighting the school area was done also in order to raise the awareness on motorized vehicles as there were no signs at all before. So while well, this area still needs further improvement on traffic calming from based on our interviews and uh, local residents generally find these interventions helpful. However, um, based on evaluations of perceptions and user observations, some major consensus of not lowering vehicles on these narrow uh, alleys still need to be pushed further. And so the, um, this is also highly appreciated. I said this is the main access to the MRT stations from the local street. And this project was actually initiated by the collaborations of us, ITDP and MRT Jakarta, which fundings all came from MRT Jakarta CSR as they have committed to improve accessibility to their stations. And this pilot project used more or less 3000 US dollars for the million rupiah for 250 meters total length of interventions. Um, and during the process, other collaborators get on board, including local government and city level technical sub agencies. And also on the second uh, implementations in other stations, MRT also collaborate with its design and engineering vendors and also on other institutions. Uh, but also how to bring this uh, further is we mapped out all stakeholders that are responsible for local road improvement and showing it to the governor during his visit to the pilot locations. Because in just one road, there can be around five different agencies that have to be coordinated in order to make a physical improvement. And often the bottleneck is in the bureaucracy. So this low budget intervention made mostly with non-government parties shows what can be achieved if different government agencies can collaborate. So yeah, this is second locations of the implementations which follow the same design process, but the issue is different because it's more like a wayfinding issues because a lot of temporary residents are living around here. They are struggling to find a way to the MRT. And uh, also this project has attracted other institutions to join the initiative as um, government officials have been used to seeing this kind of low budget interventions and they are becoming more convinced to do it on a larger scale, which we are starting to do now because we are currently working on, a, on creating safe intersections for pedestrians and cyclists near an MRT stations. And this is a, a huge area of intersections that has an existing bike lane with high number of pedestrians and cyclist crossings, but are not very safe yet. And so this project is going to be the first large scale tactical urbanism in Jakarta, which involves the provincial government. And so I think if this one success, we might expect more of these things to happen in other places in Jakarta or better be permanently implemented. So yeah, I think that's all from me. Thank you, and we might discuss later. Great, thank you so much, Anissa. And we can go ahead and transition to Noor now. And I just wanna give a friendly reminder to our speakers. We are a little bit tight on time because we wanna leave enough time for a Q&A for the moderated discussion and for um, to take questions from the audience as well. All right, thank you, Christina. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, it, it looks good on my end. All right, so hi everyone and uh, welcome to today's webinar. I'm Noor Deep from ITDP Africa and I will be talking today about the Kairos intersection treatment for cycle tracks. 
So before we start, I wanted to give you an overview of Cairo. Cairo is a city of, uh, 18, of population of 18 million. And as you can see, we have many uh, pedestrian-friendly walkways with lots of greenery and trading and public spaces. However, that's not the case in many of downtown districts. And this is the area where ITTP is implementing uh, two projects, bike lanes and as well a uh, bike sharing system. And after doing many studies, we found that there is a really high need for uh, cycle tracks in downtown area due to the high demand of cycling there. So to give you an overview of the governmental cycling strategy, in 2014, President Sisi he called on Egyptians to start riding bicycles. And former Cairo government said that we need to opt for bicycles as an alternative to driving, especially that, as President Sisi said, that the use of alternative transport solutions is going to save the average Egyptian of around four pounds for per a 20 kilometer travel distance. So let's see how is cycling um, how is it happening in Egypt? So we have um, we cyclists, we use cycle as a daily mode, mode of transport, uh, as a career services, humanitarian purposes, and also as recreational sports. So we do have high demand for cyclists, but unfortunately we lack proper infrastructure. And uh, we also lack having a public uh, bike sharing system. In addition to that, most of the people, they feel unsafe cycling. Uh, in Cairo, as there are the surveys, and um, as well, they, they don't feel safe cycling at night, especially women. So, as part of having um, and encouraging to have a more sustainable city and contributing to the cycling strategy, in 2017, Cairo governor they started installing 100 bicycle racks in downtown area and the office area. Uh, in order to encourage people not to only use cycling as an entertainment, but also to use it as a daily mode of transport. And after doing many surveys, we found out that in order to make it easier to cycle in Cairo, people, most of the people responded that they need to have uh, proper bike lanes. They need to have parking for bikes, which already the governor had started the project. And we also have seen a need that there need to be a public bike sharing system. So for the public bike sharing system, um, as I said, we're implementing most of the project in downtown area because it's a very dense area. And we're planning on having 70 stations uh, with 700 cycles. And uh, currently, uh, ITTP has submitted the RFP to the governor and it's being reviewed. And very soon we're going to publicly tender uh, the RFP for the uh, for bike sharing system. So let's look deep into our bike lane network. So this is downtown area, and when we first started, we wanted to have an integrated transportation system, and we were looking. We started looking at how to connect our bike lane network to metro stations, to train stations, to parking lots, and to other attraction areas. And also we, we were having the objective of solving the last mile access. So as you can see in that network, we're having almost 15 kilometer one way bike lane network. And the red lines here represents the piloting two kilometers, which, um, which we're currently working on. So what is our previous experience in Egypt with bike lanes? As you can see in those images, we, ha we do have bike lanes, but with very minimal separation. And this causes uh, encroachment of cars. And, or you would see it as deserted as found here. There's no cyclists at all, and it's not encouraging at all. So getting deep into the intersection improvement, we started to look at all the intersections in downtown area that's connecting our network. And we started looking uh, for ways of improvement with, with low cost solutions and that would be um, fast to be implemented. So this is one of the intersections is called Mohammed Fayyid Square. And we started having the concept designs for it. So as you can see here, we're starting by outlining the bike lanes. We have also worked on having some curb uh, extensions and race cross section. We have also had pedestrian safety islands. And we worked on many factors in the street to make it more compact uh, intersection. 
So we have actually went uh, on that intersections and we have done a trial there uh, using international expertise and Michael King was one of them. And we started having cones there to outline the bike lanes and also to, to have curved extensions. And in fact, it was a very successful trial because at first when we went to the government and we told them about the idea of having cycle tracks there, they said that downtown area is a very congested area. There's no space, this would not succeed. But when he, actually they went out and they found that we were when we were trying and we were having bike lanes there, we actually found out that the traffic went very smoothly and people were happy to use the cycle lanes. And also people started actually using the curb extensions for, for public spaces where they enjoyed their time there. So it was a very successful trial. And as you can see here, we have outlined uh, the curb extensions. And if you could see from the traffic, actually no, no one really did use that area. So it was better to be used by pedestrians and by cyclists. And as you can see, it's a very minimal intervention and it actually created a very smooth traffic and there was no much congestion as many people thought. So we also looked at the streets getting into that intersection because we, we wanted to have a complete streets concept where we have space for all users. So if we look at number one, first we have bus lanes and they were actually done by uh, just for color pavement. Uh, we also had uh, space for uh, one-way bike lanes, which was around two meters with physical separations. And we also had that color paved and bike markings and physical separations uh, to create safety for the pedestrians. Uh, we also minimized the vehicle lanes and we had a continuous bike lane pavement in order to add a warning for the vehicles, which is number four, and guide the vessels to cross the intersection order. And last number five is that we start to look at the street furniture and the benches and the street lights that are needed to, to beautify the street. This is another intersection where uh, it's called Muhammad Faid and Abdul Tharwat. So as you can see, the addition here is that we have a curb extension, uh, which is number one and sidewalk pavement of a five meter turning radius in order to slow down the speed of the vehicles and create more public space for pedestrians and the other elements as the same as I described before. This is also a detailed design that was done by a local consultant. And here I want to show that what detailed, we detailed out the curb extensions and we had universal access ramps. So that's, that was also taken into consideration. So this is the intersection before, and this is how we opt for it after, after having a one-way cycle track and all of the elements that I just discussed. So looking into another roundabout, uh, this was this roundabout, as you can see, it's really because it has access to five main roads. And uh, first we had raised the full intersection and sidewalk pavement to slow down the crossing speed of the vehicles and make it more safe. We have also in number two, we added boards uh, to minimize the turning radius and create more public space. And uh, number three is the bike lane, and four is the bike lane pavement. And number five is the circular color mark, which is was there to strengthen the warning and protect bike lane. So this is Salat Harp Square, and this is before. Um, as you can see, it's a very wide uh, roundabout, and we tried to have it more as a compact intersection and try to organize the street and have all street elements uh, in one street in order to have a complete streets concept. And this is how we really think that it should be like, like that. It's more organized, and we want to have a bike sharing system, everything in its place, everyone is having a safe and public access. So we have actually went from prior to on-ground implementation just last month. Uh, so I'm really happy that we started in that phase. And also, as last, I wanted to say that we're also looking for reclaiming the public spaces and try to avoid those many parkings that are found everywhere, especially if we have already a good supply of parkings and start looking more for public spaces so people can use it and enjoy their time there. And thank you very much. Great, thank you, Noor. Um, we can go ahead and transition into our last presentation from Ashwadi. 
Thank you, Christina. Can you see my screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So hello, everybody. I'm Ashwati Dilip from ITDP India. And I would like to take you through how we in India have been using tactical urbanism interventions to strategically build support and expand our work on street design projects. So let me teleport your, all of you into uh, one of our streets in Chennai. So this is a typical street where we have a lot of, uh, you know, shopping on one side. This is a street where more than 5,000 people walk per hour per direction. Yet you can see that the sidewalks or footpaths are of poor condition. Uh, the street is characterized by a lot of informal parking and there is a lot of traffic which is, con which is uh, making the street entirely congested. Now, Imagine if this particular street was going to be transformed into a pedestrian heaven where um, it is a priority for pedestrians and cyclists and only public transportation. Now, this was a dream that we tried to share with some of our uh, government officials. What are the questions that we get faced? Is this design even feasible? Ask uh, the government officers. Now, traffic police officers have another question. Where will the traffic flow? What about parking? Ask the shopkeepers. Where will our shoppers park? And if there is no parking, they will not come to our streets. Now, if there's so much of space that is given for pedestrians, what sort of activities will take place? These are just a few questions, but there are many, many such questions which actually um, are bombarded to us when we come up with such um, a, a dream. So how do we, you know, how can we tackle and how can we build support for this particular dream such that we can actually transform this into long-term change? So tactical urbanism interventions, as many of my co-speakers have uh, already mentioned, and let me quickly sort of take you through it once again, are they're quick, they're temporary, they're low cost, and they can actually, you know, uh, they can bring the entire community together for building support for this particular project. And the main idea is to ensure that we can have long-term change in the future. So I'm gonna take you through a couple of, uh, a few interventions and how we've used the intervention to build support from different stakeholders is what my presentation is going to focus on. So here is an example of a street from Pune in Maharashtra, one of the Western states of uh, India. And uh, this is again a commercial street, as you can see, yet the pedestrian realm was uh, extremely poor. So the idea was that can we convert one half of the street into a pedestrian space and ensure that we have parking uh, or we have parking and traffic flowing only on one side. Since this particular design faced a lot of pushback from the citizens, the city, uh, with support from ITDP, decided to test this particular project. So this was a very quick intervention. A few, um, uh, you know, we had a few seaters. We had some plants which were put up, and this particular space on one side was converted into a space for people to walk while there was traffic on the other side. What did this intervention do? It helped the shopkeepers understand what sort of an impact this uh, a project where pedestrians are given priority would have? And how did this help us? Let me just take you once again back into the previous slide. With various discussions with the shopkeepers, the shopkeepers decided to give away the front setback that you can see uh, in front of uh, their shops into the pedestrian space. So now we had a design which was uh, which was uh, not exactly the way we imagined it, nor was it exactly where the shopkeepers imagined it, but we had something that we could balance in between where the shopkeepers gave us the space in a private space in front of their shops to be converted into public realm, whereas we had um, traffic flowing on both sides. So this was a win-win situation for both of us. And it now the space is very widely used by pedestrians. And this is, um, let me take you through to the next project where here the main pushback was from the traffic police. So this is the project that I was showing you initially, another public um, um, commercial street in India, which we wanted to convert into a pedestrian realm where we got a lot of pushback from traffic police. The question was, if we stop traffic on this particular street, where will traffic ply on the other streets, would it result in congestion in many of the neighboring streets is, is the big question that was looming over our head. 
So again, we did pilots on different days. We tested the design on a weekday and on a weekend. Again, very, very simple, low cost methods using barricades, pots, and ensuring that there were various activities like music, dance, etc., to keep the space active and lively. We were uh, able to build support from the traffic police. And today, um, one important aspect was that we tested and um, we looked at how the traffic was flying. We did studies of the traffic on the neighboring streets as well. And we were able to prove that there was no traffic congestion uh, piling up on the neighboring streets. And as a result, we've been able to transform this particular street where more than two thirds of the street are now um, more than two thirds of the street are for pedestrians and we have a third of the street where traffic is flying. So again, here again, there was, um, uh, you know, we had to, there was a balance. So now this is uh, one lane of traffic on both sides. And here, while we had imagined it to be only public transportation, we do have private vehicles as well. But we think it's a great win where more than uh, two thirds of the space have now been prioritized for pedestrians. So we've also been working with the traffic police on testing uh, intersections. Again, very simple, using barricades, etc. Now, while the first two cases were examples of where we had a design, where we had funding for the project, but the whole idea was about building support for the concept. Here is an example of where we had to create, a, think of how we can create safe neighborhood streets in uh, an area where there was no funding allocated at all. So this was a street where there were a lot of, uh, it was a neighborhood street where there was a school and most of the sc uh, school children being from economically weaker section were walking or cycling to the school. And this entire street had, cars which were parked or which were abandoned and it was very very dangerous uh, for uh, children and the residents to walk in this neighborhood uh, especially in the evenings and the night so um, we were uh, in, we got in touch with the school uh, the resident association in fact reached out to us we put them in touch also with the traffic police uh, so the school the resident association the traffic police and us we all came together um, and we looked at ways in which we could transform this particular space where we would be using very minimal funding. And here the funding came from corporate social responsibility funds of the HDFC bank, which is a, a private bank in India. So again, here it was a great idea where we were able to reclaim street, uh, space on the street. We colored it up. Um, all the different stakeholders were able to engage with each other. And once the street was transformed, more than 90% of the children used this particular space. And the perception of safety had increased by leaps and bounds. You can just see from the smiles on the children's faces. Now, while we use tactical urbanism intervention for you know, actual projects, sometimes our projects may take, a too, may, may take too long and TUs become a very good tool for building momentum for long-term change. So here was an example of a project in one of the smaller towns where uh, we had got the designers, yet the project was taking a bit of a time. So in order to keep the momentum going, what we did was we tested the project out again with with barricades simple just one particular intersection but uh, it created a lot of vibrance uh, in the city where the different stakeholders came together a lot of newspapers writing about it so there was we were able to keep the momentum for the actual final project ongoing through the process and we used tactical urbanism as a tool for this finally while we are uh, while while we may focus on projects itself um, the last but not least, like, I'd like to also focus on how we want to just look at how can we reimagine streets as public spaces and we use the tool as car free Sundays. So here uh, it was the government. Um, so there was the corporation of Chennai along with uh, traffic police and um, a, a, a media house. We came together and just closed up the street and opened it up for this uh, city to use for their own purposes, for cycling, for playing, uh, you know, for just having fun. So these are uh, a few examples of how we've used tactical urbanism interventions. I'll just very quickly take you through the process uh, on um, the last slide. So it's very important for us to identify the site and why we are doing it. Next, you would really like, uh, it's important to identify all the important stakeholders and build support and uh, work with them through the entire process. 
uh, please carry out analysis of the intervention prior uh, prior to actually doing the intervention to see how poor the condition was. Develop the design or, or envision the change together. Prepare the site. Once we implement the intervention, it's very, very important for us to do post-intervention analysis. And it's extremely imp important for us to publicize the change through media, videos, blogs, social media, etc. So this is the change that we were doing in uh, India, and I hope you found this presentation useful. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Ashwati. I think that um, for the sake of time, we will just go straight into the live Q&A. Um, and what I will do is pose one question to each speaker, and we can take it from there. Um, so if the speakers could please turn on their videos and I will also share my template screen. Great, thank you so much, everyone. So I will um, go into the first question here and um, pose it to Daniele. Um, it is, let's see here. Um, it is towards the bottom from Angie. So for these Brazilian interventions, how often um, did your team go to collect data and uh, what was chosen to be collected? And um, can you also go into why some of the projects were unable to become permanent interventions? Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, okay. <laughs> well, and how often we go for the data collection? It, it depends on the on the city and the, and the time for implementation we had. But normally, what we try to do is we go well once before the 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 pop up to do the, the before data collection, and that was it's normally the same date of week and not like not trying to trying trying to not take a, a typical days and really getting like the, a sense of the, the problems in that area. And then we go once uh, during, like where well, we collect data and surveys during during the pop-up. And the only one so far we managed to get some data collection after the permanent implementation was Santana. And this is it normally. Like, it's, it's a few days, it, it's not like a very extensive data collection. We, we managed to do, like to get a sense of what's happening but it's not, it could be, it could be improved. And the other question was, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> um, I think, uh, what were some of the challenges in um, having the projects permanent? Okay. Well, in that, it, it also depends on the city, mostly political will and lack of resources, or at least like we're waiting for, uh, contract opportunities so we can include that that interventions but mostly like in, in Sorocaba we had a change in the in, in the a political change so the project got us, uh, it's now aside in Sao Paulo we had like delays due to also lack of resources or well resources are being applied in other areas so I guess that that's one of the arguments too that we can help because we do have, it's not that we don't have resources because the, the interventions, they are not expensive. It's really, they are, it's up, been applied somewhere else. And so ideally, if you can look for implementation opportunities, like try to look for a, I don't know, a bigger project that's happening where you can put that intervention uh, together and like it, it helps to accelerate the, the process. Great, thank you so much, Danielle. Um, I will go into a second question here and it's going to be for Anissa. So with these tactical urbanism projects and interventions, how were accessibility measures um, incorporated and assessed? And also what were some of the challenges that you face um, with other vehicles and prioritizing space um, for uh, pedestrians and cyclists? Yes, so for the accessibility assessment, we are actually using uh, the ITDP COD standard. So um, we're assessing the essentials of pedestrians accessibility, which lies in six components of the quality of walkways, the crosswalks, sheds and shelters, visually active frontage, physically permeable frontage, and also driveway density. 
And so um, while uh, the challenges, uh, sorry, what was the second question? The, in um, managing street space as there uh, um, for pedestrian oh. cyclists with other modes present. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, I think it's 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 still uh, a challenge because then it also requires the the um, the consensus of the local uh, residents as well because we're basically more working in shared streets and uh, it is kind of felt with uh, local residents as well. But uh, we are always trying to push them to have their own consensus of um, changing the behavior of the vehicles users basically so kind of um, forcing pushing the communities to make a consensus is the way as well for our case great thank you so much anisa so this next question here will go to Noor um, and is is um, towards the top from Ali um, so what do we do if there are uh, there is the city public or people from the city asking to build more parking spaces or just in general, uh, more space for cars and motorized vehicles instead of cycling paths and, and footpaths. And the reason I think it's interesting to ask um, in your case is because you should kind of some of the more newer interventions and tactical urbanism projects that you have in Cairo. So what are some of the challenges and how you're mitigating um, um, those different discussions um, in Cairo. All right, thanks for your question. So in Cairo, um, we had that mindset from the government from the very first beginning, where they thought that we should create more spaces for cars, and they're actually continuing in many of the areas by building more bridges and just looking out how cars could be accommodated and neglecting uh, the pedestrians and the cyclists. And when we first came to uh, start advocating for our project uh, and saying that we need to reduce the parking spaces, so numbers here had a great win for us because we went there, we did studies, we did the parking surveys, and we did measurements for yeah, like uh, car counts and pedestrian counts, and we did many surveys. And this is where we came and showed numbers and show how, the, for instance, if you have enough supply of parking spaces, how you could use other areas to create more uh, complete streets concept. And um, so this was how to put the government on board. The other thing was that um, I believe that everything should be done on, on phasing. Uh, uh, phasing uh, is very good. Like you, in our network, you don't have to start with all intersections all at once. You should start by intersection, intersection. And when you start, you shouldn't, like you have a vision uh, how you want this intersection to look like, but having it in phases just with try and, and start changing the governmental mindset a bit by bit, this is how you can measure the real success. Like if they found something that you have tried and it's really working, and if they said, okay, we want more, this is where you start adding uh, adding to the intersections, for instance, that you have and reach your final objective at the end. Great, thank you so much, Noor. And then finally, uh, we will have one last question and it will be for Ashwadi. Um, Ashwadi, I'm gonna combine some of the questions that we've received from the audience. Um, so the questions here are, how do you define success what are the different measures that you have for your city? And then secondly, how do we publicize this? How do we convince people in the city government, the public, that this is transform, uh, transformative change and how the city should be moving towards to more permanent impacts? Sure. Um, so I think um, success actually varies from place to place. And um, uh, you know, in, in the Indian scenario, most often we've looked at success, you know, us achieving success only when the, um, the tactical urbanism intervention has been converted into a permanent change, because that's the final goal that we want. But it may vary from place to place, because there might be another scenario where there is no funding. And, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, creating these interventions to create enough momentum for this change. So I think 
success is um, uh, is going to be context specific but in our case mostly we've always been you know we we've considered it to be a success only when a project has been converted into a permanent change so that is one um christina what was your second question and um what are some of the tools to publicize this success um whether it be with the city or with the media um or with locals to uh, make us move some of these changes to be permanent yeah so uh the the most important uh you know the the second piece of it is that um we're going to be using a lot of energy to do this particular tactical urbanism intervention so it uh, it is very important for us to capture the impact of this particular project so doing a quick uh, pre assessment um, a, a study and doing a, a you know a, a good post assessment study will be very useful uh, you know considering that you're going to be putting a lot of effort into this particular project and once you have this data there are multiple ways that you can actually uh, publicize this so one and we definitely reach out to the media because media likes these kind of tangible transformation so if you could have you know um um information that's written up like 90% of this like you know the street becomes uh, safer by 90% with this particular intervention and uh, so some those sort of emotional stories are things that the media would pick on secondly another piece that we generally do is we try and create very simple short videos because videos are you know videos can move you so if you can create uh, you know if you can pull out all of this data have a few of the before and after pictures don't make this a very long heavy lift video but keep it short you can use multiple uh, you know uh, uh, multiple uh, tools such as um, facebook uh, instagram youtube whatsapp as various ways in which we can actually get this word uh, out so um, we also create like a formal reports so um, the tool that you use will need to be catered to the kind of stakeholder that you're engaging with so to engage with larger citizens and have a um, support for this particular project you can actually go to the media uh, you can create take reports to you know your uh, decision makers to tell them you know this is the sort of impact and where, where you have a more formal tool similarly social media again uh, helps create a lot of buzz so you will need to identify your different stakeholders and use tools which will be applicable to them i i hope i answered i answered both your questions Absolutely. You answered all the different parts Ashwati. Thank you so much. Um so I will go ahead and just wrap up the webinar today. Um but first of all just thank you to all of our panelists. Um I thought it was so fantastic seeing examples from cities around the world to show that definitely in our different contexts we face different challenges and opportunities, but we also see uh, the different successes that we have in in the different communities that we work in today. So again, thank you to Danielle, Ashwari, and Nisa Noor for your great presentations today. uh from McKenzie and Dana for for really uh corralling um our different work from our offices to share with their attendees and then lastly of course um thank you to our participants for joining our webinar uh we love interacting with you and um receiving your questions and we hope to see you all online again soon take care everyone thank you thank you so much other questions so okay